This video is brought to you today by Fat Shark and Dark Tide. The city of Tertium is under attack. My city. A dark tide of chaos is rising. Our best fighters are falling. It's time to try new tactics. Something different. Something desperate. We take you. The outcast and the criminal. The lost and the damned. Because you have nothing left to lose. we're counting on now. And if it's come to this, then God Emperor help us all. Dark Tide is coming to its full release later this year, and we've steadily seen the drip drip of information bleeding out from Atoma Prime, the hive world upon which Dark Tide is set. Now, I'm used to game previews after a decade of doing this, but what I didn't anticipate was Fat Shark specifically asking me to do a deep dive into the background of the world so early on. And so today I'm very pleased to be able to present to you a first glimpse into that background of Dark Tide and offer you some exclusive insights into the world forged by the quite legendary Warhammer 40,000 author Dan Abnett. Until now, Dark Tide has only been available to wishlist, but from today you can pre-order the game on Steam. So please go and check the link directly below this video to find out all the details about what aesthetic extras are included at launch. A new trailer was just released to us today, setting the scene for the nightmare scenario facing the hive city of Tertium. A plague has descended upon its inhabitants and all investigations are failing. Things are deteriorating out of control rapidly, and out of desperation the powers that be have enlisted from the rejects of society, the criminals, the outcasts, that's us, a team to descend into the lower depths in a vain last ditch hope to find out what is going on. So far, what's been shown of Darktide gives a clear glimpse of how they wanted to set the tone. It's bloody, it's visceral, it's dark, and it's claustrophobic, which all sits in line with how you'd want and imagine an existing hive city to be. As the outcasts, we have skills that presumably led to our incarceration in the first place, and this is our singular chance at redemption. But in the trailer today, you see just how severe the situation is, the corruption is spreading wide through the city, and heretics are everywhere. I feel obliged to note that obviously from this point on there may be what you could consider to be spoilers, so if you want the full raw experience you'll need to impose upon yourself a strict law and gameplay sequestering until Dark Tide is released on September 13th. Dark Tide presents to us the world of 40k through the first person lens of squad based action and has bravely chosen to frame the story with a more human experience. I think the purpose of enabling me to speak about the background is to try and bridge that gap between the mechanical experience of gameplay and the immersive experience of the background. A question I've already considered in other videos as soon as Dark Tide came along was of course how much room even is there in a horde shooter for lore? My thinking at the time was seemingly the correct answer, that being actually a surprising amount. Although I think another critically relevant follow up question would be what do you personally want to get out of the game? I myself have generally always taken a very slow approach to games, something I know may not exactly surprise you to hear, but this is usually because I want to sift through background details, I want to stop and look and take in those environments and see what I can discern about the world which has been created. Take time to look upon, to scour small fragments of information and lore 
and I've always felt bad as well for level designers when players sweep through an area without a second glance because all of those things are crafted so specifically and hopefully with a lot of thought and purpose. Darktide is absolutely crushed full of detail. Just from the artwork and trailers we've seen so far of the game environments, you can see the amount of attention to detail that's been considered in designing the spaces we will experience. The darkness of the environments, the ambient lighting, and the fact that everything has a sense of applicable, rationalised purpose in the context of the lore makes it a world we simply want to know more about and see for ourselves. This is what we're thinking about when we consider just what you will get out of exploring Dark Tide as a player, and considering is there room for lore and narrative in such a brutal, action-filled experience. Of course, there is no specifically right or wrong way to approach it, and this is entirely the point. There will be people who want to tackle a co-op action shooter looking purely for that grinding gameplay loop, just as there will be those who want to learn the story and really feel the full immersion of the experience. For many more people, they'll fall somewhere in between, ready to kick back and just enjoy eviscerating some heretics. Dark Tide shouldn't really be looked upon as a sequel, but more of an evolution from Vermintide. And while the previous games served as a solid foundation for the 40k experience, Dark Tide is distinct in terms of its gameplay, most obviously with the inclusion of a necessary arsenal of ranged weaponry, essential for it to fit within the 40k verse, and as one might well imagine, a huge shift in the dynamics of gameplay. The story we know so far, pieced together from gameplay trailers, damaged radio reports from the Hive world, and other official information. We've learned that the world of Atoma Prime is suffering some form of sudden explosion of disorder. Initially seen as little more than fairly standard Hive discontent, it has quickly spiralled into sector-wide lockdowns, evacuations, even prompted the recall of Imperial Guard regiments that had been on deployment to system fringe locations. We know that the communications for urgent assistance are being sent from Atoma Prime, the core system world and location of Hive Tertium, home to some 90 billion human souls, and that is the accurate number. The situation has become so critical that seemingly an Inquisition or Scout or member of a retinue is in communication already with an Inquisitor, presumably en route to the system. Exactly how that will resolve or potentially further complicate matters is obviously unknown, but more about Inquisitors later. We enter the world as a group of condemned prisoners, presumably selected for our specific skills, recruited from a penal ship to engage in a mission we are most likely expected to perish on. For the Imperium, there is little more disposable human waste than your penal workers, as individuals occupying the lowest echelons of Imperial society will most likely have been selected and deployed in coordination with a member of the Inquisitorial Retinue, or even perhaps a delegated subordinate of said retinue. Direct interaction with the lowest of the low as an Inquisitor of the Imperium, undesirable and unthinkable, unless specifically warranted. One of the things that we are learning as Darktide is slowly revealed to us is that the lore of the verse has been approached with as much respect and attention as possible, while simultaneously still looking to craft a game that is mechanically and intuitively enjoyable. There are always limitations and compromises necessary when bridging lore and game merely to make it functional, in the same way that Tabletop 40k rarely represents with acute accuracy the background material that is theoretically so deeply tied to it. Like how this week, for example, I was regaled with the tale of a Tau commander from a community tabletop battle who defeated an Imperial Knight in close combat. Make of that what you will. The point is, Darktide has set out a very clear ambition of not only producing a verse accurate and immersive gameplay experience, but to additionally, via the game, found and create an entire world permanently set within the verse of 40k, which is very exciting. Atoma Prime and its star system will have an established position on the galactic map of the 40k galaxy, it will become an established world, and from there, who knows, maybe we could even see further expansion through 40k literature telling us stories of both the past and future of Atoma Prime and Tertium. The 40k crime series, of which I'm a considerable fan at this point, has already given us Vorongantua, the hive city on the world of Alecto, a fascinating planet which contains a strange order of the Mechanicus and a population who barely believe Xenos even exist. Well, 
now, Darktide is gifting the 40k verse, Tertium Hive, and Atoma Prime. Darktide promises to be an exploration into the depths of a hive city from the distinctly more human perspective, arguably overlapping into what is often referred to as the domestic side of 40k. While the Emperor's Angels, the immense transhuman warriors, the Space Marines battle on the front lines of the most severe threats facing the galaxy, simultaneously upon innumerable worlds of the Imperium, it is all too commonly left to the human citizenry to deal with threats that potentially could lead to the destruction or corruption of entire worlds. This is of course the endless balancing act of military power the Imperium must continually play. Deploy available forces to a system at the right time and you may save it. Delay their deployment to retain a defensive advantage elsewhere. Such decisions may result in the loss of billions of lives and entire planets consigned to historical record as now dead worlds. As we enter into the world of Darktide, Tertium Hive is at a critical juncture. It stands upon a precipice, and we are about to experience firsthand what awaits those who serve at the indirect command of an Imperial Inquisitor. Like so many planets throughout the Imperium, survival or destruction depends on the unmodified humans of the Imperium to reveal the seriousness of threat facing Toma Prime and the Mobian Domain. Of course, the far more troubling questions remain because wherever the insidious corruption of the warp is discovered, this is never something to be underestimated, nor is it easily purged from a world. Not to mention, the involvement of an Inquisitor brings with it its own problems, unanswered questions which may well determine the ultimate fate of any world in the Imperium. Most importantly, the specific ideological outlook of the Inquisitor will be a major factor in determining whether a world lives or dies, and their decisions based upon the information and experience we, as these convicted members of Imperial citizenry, are able to secure from the depths of the colossal hive city upon Atoma Prime. Darktide promises an invitation to elicit whatever experience you're looking to acquire from a first-person immersive dive into the depths of an Imperial city of the 40k verse. A hive city the size of a small country or continent even, and currently undergoing a violent state of disorder at the behest of terrifying entities unknown to the vast majority of humanity. Before we discuss more though, let us study just what brought the Mobian Domain, Atoma Prime, and Tertium Hive to this point in time, as we explore exclusively for the first time the origins and timeline of the world we will soon be able to explore firsthand in Darktide. The development of human civilization into a period of technological zenith is known to some as the Golden Age or the Age of Technology. We believe that this began somewhere between M15 and M21. The M in this dating system refers to the specific millennia. For example, right now in 2022, we are in the 21st century of the third millennium, M3. From the period of M15 onward, this is believed to have been the height of humanity's journey to acquire knowledge and progress in scientific achievement, although by M41 little, if any, information remains available to the humans of the Imperium. They have only scattered broken fragments of information to piece together from this time. It is to all intents and purposes lost to the mists of time. All that we seem to be sure of is that it was a period of vast human expansion and technological zenith. Humanity had accelerated forward significantly both ideologically and scientifically to reach a point where it stood among the most advanced races in the entire galaxy. Science was effectively their god, and it's often speculated as to just what design ordinary human life took the form of during this time. Again though, unfortunately any details of such specifics are barely ever to be found. The Imperium though now refers to this ancient past of humanity as the Dark Age of Technology. This is primarily due to their fear and lack of understanding about such matters, but it's also because it was believed that humanity had gained such power it was unable to safely control it. And this combined with its use of AI were largely what brought around the collapse of human civilization on a galactic scale. Somewhere around the time of M23, an event so devastating and severe nearly caused the extinction of the human race. Humanity was barely able to cling on to its survival and emerged significantly damaged as a result. Were it not for the events that were still to come, 
things may have been brought back from the brink, but humanity was then hit by a second wave of galactic catastrophe around M25. This nail in the coffin for the Golden Age came in the form of the Age of Strife, which sealed humanity's fate to an extended period of isolation and destruction coupled with hostile warp entities scouring entire worlds as early psychers were consumed by these dark beings. Many psychers unwittingly became warp portals, thus allowing the horrors of the Immaterium to pour forth like a tsunami and devour colonized human worlds. The stellar exodus occurred many millennia before these horrors deluged a significantly weakened humanity. The exodus was the earliest period of human expansion where we began to send the first true colony ships from Terra, that's Earth, out among the stars. The first colony worlds were within our own solar system, like Mars, and then humanity began to reach out into the great void beyond. A major problem, however, was that for many of these early colonists, their ships were only capable of sub-light travel. This meant journeys of inevitably significant distances would take many generations to reach their ultimate destinations. Consequently, essential trade would be almost non-existent and they would instead need to rely upon whatever was brought with them in order to thrive and survive. Most often, this took the form of colonists cannibalizing their own ships by landing upon a world and then dismantling it. This is one reason why by the period of M41, it is considered extremely unlikely to discover any remnants from this early time. Most likely, all materials of the ships which brought humanity to new worlds were completely recycled and repurposed. Rumours often persist about the darkest depths of a hive world and what may lie deep, deep in the lowest foundations. Unfortunately, navigating to such depths is extremely dangerous and many who attempt to do so are never seen again. This period of expansion also led to the necessary development of what would become a keystone of human colonization, the so-called STC systems. Standard template constructs are believed to have been some form of early AI and were computer systems able of producing solutions to any problem. It made sense for humanity in the time of expansion to equip all colony ships with an STC as they contained the sum total of human knowledge, thereby gifting colonists when they reached their final destination a far greater chance of success and the ability to use almost any materials available to fabricate critical solutions for issues such as environment, food production, energy and defense of their new colony from any and all threats. The STC enabled humanity to successfully colonize worlds, but just how or if it contributed equally to the downfall of human civilization in this zenith period is unknown. What is known though, is that in the current time of M41, the Imperium and Mechanicus obsessively seek any and all hard copy fragments of STC. For often, they provide technology that is far beyond the capability of humanity in M41, and the Mechanicus even see these as holy relics which must be treated as if they were gifted from the Omnissiah itself. During the early stellar exodus is when the worlds of the Mobian domain, including what would eventually be designated as Atoma Prime, are believed to have been colonized. This could well have been as early as M15, but of course records to this effect are sketchy at best. The Mobian domain is located in a cluster of now inhabited systems in the galactic northwest of Segmentum Solar. Most colonies of the earliest expansions are likely to be within Segmentum Solar for the obvious reasons that sublight travel at greater distances in this early time would be exponentially a greater risk of failure and why travel so far when there were plenty of systems and worlds ripe for colonization in this early time. The aforementioned collapse of the zenith age of technology comes in a confusing downward spiral presumed to be due to the AI humanity had created to enable its vast expansion across the galaxy. However, specifics are very muddy. It's unknown just what was corrupted and why. Speculation is rife that AI had advanced to a level of self-awareness so unprecedented that it was near to indistinguishable from humans, that as a result, it became capable of being corrupted by the warp as humanity would be in the coming Age of Strife. 
These concepts bleed into ideas of just what consciousness truly is, and philosophical questions about, at an atomic level, what is the mind. Our brains, for example, are made up of atoms and molecules, as is all matter. But are our thoughts and imaginations also? It's an enduring question only speculated about currently, but such thoughts presumably were answered during the zenith period of humanity's golden age. It's also unknown in this time what role advanced genetics and cybernetic development may have played in the catastrophic downfall of human civilization. For countless stable inhabited worlds that had formed the Galactic Federation of Humanity in this technological epoch, the collapse would be devastating and sudden. Whatever initially triggered it created a cascade from which there could be no return. Then came the Great Isolation during the Age of Strife, which saw worlds which had clung on through the remnants of interstellar trade reliant now entirely on themselves. Worlds which had required massive imports to support their populations quickly turned in on themselves and chaos ensued. Many planets would be already tearing themselves to pieces caused by the massive disturbances in the warp which cut off all travel across the galaxy. Only then was this made worse as horrors of the immaterium such as enslavers destroyed the minds of citizens and many worlds were permanently scoured of human life. For the Mobian domain, it did not escape these apocalyptic end times. It was cut off from other systems in the Segmentum Solar, but was seemingly stable enough within its own system to allow human culture to persist. This was a common factor in the survival of human colonies of this period in history. For planets which had limited resources and perhaps colonized only one core world in a system were potentially those most at risk, whereas colonies who had established settlements across multiple worlds and were within sublight travel to local systems had some options available to them. During the isolation period of the Age of Strife, worlds which endured often established localized domains with trade between systems at sublight speed and they were able to thusly support one another. For the Mobian Domain, they actually weathered the Age of Strife well, with the named planets of Crucis and Atoma both surviving. How much contact they had is unknown, but populations weathered the storm of the apocalypse. Some worlds, which had less well-established colonies on the periphery of the system, were less successful. As was often the case for worlds post-Dark Age of Technology, the significant period of isolation meant that many also became comfortable in their isolation. The technological collapse left many human civilizations unable to or fearful to tread the path that had led to the fall of mankind, and countless more worlds had simply been so preoccupied with survival that record keeping became a low priority. Within the Mobian domain, all other human worlds, including their origins from Terra, faded into the past. Maybe such things were spoken about as mythical tales, but few would take such children's stories seriously. Transformations such as this occurred throughout the Age of Strife and into the shadow of its aftermath. It would also continue into the modern period of M41. It's still not unheard of for the Imperium to discover new worlds which have been entirely isolated and are unaware that any other human civilizations exist still in the galaxy. Such things can happen in a galactic empire that spans many millions of worlds. For the worlds of the Mobian domain though, they weathered the storm well. Worlds that were lost in this time may contain archaeological remains, but likely that is all. While presumed to be dead worlds, such places are in fact the location of many Mechanicus expeditions who dig down to discover lost archaeotech from the Dark Age of Technology. The world of Atoma was situated to best weather the tempest of the Age of Strife. It emerges from this time in a relatively strong position, both in terms of civilian citizen strength and its industrial capacity. It continues to build on this by developing military hardware and assets to protect from any further threats, remembering that the leadership at this point in time believe themselves to be entirely independent and to be self-reliant in all respects. The Emperor launches his great crusade to the stars with the ambition of reuniting the lost colonies of humanity and to once again form a galactic network of trade, support and collective ambition. To what ultimate end continues to remain something shrouded in mystery, although speculations to answer the questions posed by the Emperor's grand plans never cease. The Emperor launches a vast campaign with an armada of many thousands of vessels known as Expeditionary Fleets, 
Their core objectives are uniting any and all human worlds. Subsidiary goals include charting and cataloguing all information relating to discovered systems, resources and threats encountered, so as to provide a detailed cartography of the known galaxy, to better chart and communicate all spatial information for future endeavours and the rebuilding of a unified galactic human civilization to be known as the Imperium. The Emperor's Crusade contained a wide assortment of vessels and military contingents. Most fleets contained elements of what was known as the Imperial Army and the Imperialis Armada. These were the predecessors of the Imperial Guard and Imperial Navy respectively. There were also commonly Mechanicum support elements and then the most powerful forces deployed to planets were of course the Astartes Legions and the Titan Legions. The Imperial Army would regularly garrison worlds once they'd been subjugated and joined the Emperor's new galactic empire, either willingly or through force. There was no choice in the matter, of course, all human worlds, no matter their technological state of advancement, stability or population, were allowed to remain independent, with very obviously the exception of Mars, all were required to comply or face the brutal onslaught of the Astartes. Many worlds did resist, of course, unaware of just what awaited them, were they to in fact resist, and this saw planetary assaults on a vast, horrifying scale, commonly leading to catastrophic loss of human populations on worlds who very aggressively resisted the will of the Emperor. In places, this resistance not only slowed the momentum of expeditionary forces, but they also had to invest time by establishing garrisons upon worlds to ensure order was then maintained, as well as deploying teams of administrators and iterators to help in the re-education of populations to the new ideology of the Emperor's Imperial Truth. The philosophy being based around atheist, rationalist and materialist principles, it essentially taught what many believe to have been concepts not so far removed from what could have been similar views held by humanity during the Golden Age. It fundamentally sought to reframe the thinking of many worlds which had by now reverted back into religious or superstitious beliefs, which were very likely quite reasonably founded from the horrors seen during the Age of Strife. The Emperor's iterators instead sought to reset human thinking to one that saw the universe as being a rational space where knowledge defeated fear, free of mysticism, magic and gods. Thankfully for the worlds of the Mobian domain, they did not require the harsh subjugation or re-education so commonly seen throughout the Great Crusade. It was just as common that Imperial forces would arrive to systems that had been isolated for millennia and where reunification into a wider Imperium would in fact be welcomed gladly. Undoubtedly, it was a profound shock to discover that humanity still existed among the stars, but for many extremely isolated worlds who had suffered their fair shares of Xenos invasion over the years, the sight and prospect of being bolstered and supported by the quite obviously powerful forces of this Emperor from Terra were a welcome relief. For the noble aristocracy that ruled at this time, reintegration with a wider galactic human civilization was obviously a beneficial move and so the Mobian Domain would become part of the nascent Imperium, as was often the case when a system or world rejoined the galactic civilization of the Imperium willingly, they were allowed to retain their own local governorship, as this was usually in the interests of all concerned. The planet of Atoma would be the first planet liberated, if you will, by the Crusade, and was assessed to be a significant asset due to its functioning and highly productive industrial factorums. Consequently, Atoma is immediately tasked with producing materials to support the ongoing efforts of the Crusade. Again, a common occurrence to ensure that stable supply chains for ongoing needs of the expeditionary fleets during this time. Another world, Crucis, is discovered nearby and liberated also. In this instance, its leadership is then required to cede authority to the more powerful world of Atoma because it is now a system capital world. Atoma is retitled Atoma Prime. The Imperial Administrators create the position of the first Lord or Lady Mobian to effectively govern the system. On the fringe worlds of the Mobian Domain, there have always been ongoing Xenos Troubles. These are brutally and quickly crushed by the Crusade forces, who lead campaigns of suppression as was typical of the expeditionary fleets. Many Xenos on these outer planets are entirely exterminated, others are heavily suppressed to the point they represent minimal to no threat. The planets of Camaris, Karnas, 
and Infidus Brim are brought back under the stewardship of Atoma Prime as a result. As the situation within the Mobian Domain has now stabilised, the Crusade fleet moves on, leaving any residual pacification on fringe worlds in the system to be handled by garrisoned forces and the newly established leadership. When the heresy finally is exposed, it threatens to tear the Imperium apart. Some worlds fall to the traitors almost immediately, or had been already largely converted to the cause due to their association with specific legions. Other worlds unable to determine who are the real traitors descend into anarchy, and many worlds burn as the populace turn upon one another. Some worlds decided they wanted no part in the destruction, happy to sit things out and pledge allegiance to the victor. Others bide their time, waiting for a more clear picture before pledging themselves and committing all support. All of these decisions will have profound implications for many worlds across the next 10,000 years. Hesitation or abstention will be viewed very poorly in the aftermath of the heresy. Thankfully, for the worlds of the Mobian Domain, they remain profoundly loyalist from the outset of the heresy. It continues to supply and support loyalist efforts throughout the heresy and into the post-heresy period. Like so many worlds though, they do not escape unscathed, and consequently an interim government is established on the world of Crucis to allow Atoma Prime to be restored to a position of stability and productivity once again. At this time, a major domain navy battle fleet depot is established at Crucis. Entering M32, Atoma Prime is still recovering from the aftermath of the heresy and is still not at full production output. The war continuing on the fringe of the Mobian Domain has not abated and has become a persistent annoyance, requiring a now permanent deployment of military assets to contain it. Periodically, the situation flares in intensity and could be classified as a war. The world of Comoros remains the primary imperial bastion of the fringe region. Finally, toward the later period of M32, Crucis passes its administrative powers back to Atoma Prime peacefully and Atoma Prime is restored to its position as the capital world. Additionally, the Navy Depot of Crucis is also moved back to Atoma Prime. Details about the 2000 year period from M33 to M35 have been, for reasons unknown, heavily redacted, including the nature of the Xenos threat on the fringes, which now starts to become a far more serious threat. In the early time of this period, there are minor disturbances, as there might be upon many worlds of the Imperium. Additionally, some small dynastic civil wars occur among the nobility, interhive, and guild wars. Occasionally, what are referred to generically as just Xenos spark conflicts on the fringe region and require a concerted effort to pacify the area. Somewhere around M34, the world of Rosiria is reclaimed as part of the Mobian Domain. It is unclear and unspecified as to whether it had been previously or what specifically occurred to return it to Imperial control. Around this same time, a major Xenos war is believed to have occurred on the fringe region, and a period of extensive warfare is required to keep it suppressed. At the turn of M35, the wars on the fringe again flare, this time with what's noted as a considerable push into the core space of the Mobian domain. Consequently, an Imperial force is said to have arrived to bolster forces on the front lines of the Fringe War, but the nature of this force, including its origin, is unspecified, including as to who ordered it. As a result, though, of this additional military power, the Xenos thread is fragmented and driven back once again. This period, though, appears to also have caused some destabilization in the Mobian domain. Records indicate a rumbling civil war the fact that this is not clarified suggests it could have been mere civilian disturbances of discontent or something more significant. However, it's notable that it's recorded that a victorious alliance now enters as the rulers of Atoma Prime. A new leader, Yanis Barquette, is elected as Lord Mobian. We have no details as to just what occurred here. It's entirely possible that due to the ongoing fringe war and the lack of military power upon core worlds, a small coup took place among the noble houses of a hive, such things are not unheard of. This would align with talk of civil war and new alliances being put into power. This though is mere speculation as the details are either missing or redacted that would give us further clarification. 
The important thing to note is that this period is one of apparently serious instability. In the latter period of M35, the world of Infidus Brim is also noted as having been reclaimed as a vassal world of the Mobian Domain, and the apparently victorious alliance, as it's referred to, expands and is now rebuilding a hive city cluster, forming what will become the vast, sprawling prime world hive city of Tertium. The largest impact of note during this time period is upon the environment of Atoma Prime. The continual industrial output, war, and hive sprawl has caused a significant impact on the ecological biosphere. As is the case with many hive worlds over time, the massive amounts of pollution can end up causing a total ecological collapse, and this is why many hive worlds end up as essentially dead worlds, apart from their vast hive cities, which then steadily require considerable support in the form of technology, off-world imports, and resources that are no longer available from the natural resources of a world. So suspiciously, details of this entire 2000 year period are very sketchy at best, but what appears to occur based purely on the fragmented information available is that the fringe wars become more severe for reasons unspecified, hive cities upon Atoma use this to leverage political instability and force a power grab, and then upon consolidating their power, this cluster of victorious alliances began expansion projects that further connect the supercluster of hive cities upon Atoma Prime and begin the final stages of them becoming one massive singular hive city conurbation. The expansion of the cluster of hive cities continues. This leads to them eventually becoming the foundational structure that evolves into the mammoth hive city now named Tertium. This is not an unheard of process upon a hive world. Some hive city planets like for example Necromunda have multiple hive city clusters. Upon Necromunda the primary city cluster is known as the Palatine Cluster. It's centered around a hive which used to be known as Palatine, it's now titled Primus. Sometimes hive cities will be constructed upon so consistently that eventually they will link together, and this is what appears to have occurred upon Atoma Prime. This would explain why, when the world is viewed from orbit, Tertium appears so unbelievably massive. Because it is. The unfortunate negative of this seemingly exponential period of expansion was the continued damage to the ecology of the planet. It had already suffered significantly in previous millennia, but the massive scale of construction and industrial output pushes the planet into total ecological collapse now. Atoma Prime is a dust wasteland, not dissimilarly to Necromunda. Consequently, any remaining populations outside of the Hive City now merge, and Tertium Hive becomes the singular population center for the planet. The noble dynastic rivalry continues, as it always does within the highest spires of a Hive world, and in M36, House Margrave replaces Barquette as the ruling house following yet another period of instability. One might choose to refer to it as a civil war, but records are again unclear as to just how this unseating of the former Lord Mobian took place. Now, one Anselm Margrave is declared Lord Mobian. However it took place, the transfer of power was strong enough that it remained stable from here to the present time in M41, where House Margrave continued to rule over the system from Atoma Prime. The world, known as Mornax, is recorded as being brought now into the Mobian Domain in this period as another vassal world. In the next few thousand years, the Domain enters a period of stability and calm. There are no records of any major incident or problem, nor do the Xenos Fringe Wars appear to have flared, as they may have done in the past. We might wish to consider that things are in fact suspiciously quiet. There is no information though, which exists to point to any reason or cause for immediate concern. Some straightforward historical data entries occur during this quite significant period of time though. M38, the worlds of Mornax and Branx Magna are officially granted status as part of the Mobian Domain. In the latter part of M39, the world known as Incron is now reclaimed and also becomes part of the domain. The Battlefleet Navy Depot is relocated here for unspecified reasons. In the early period of M41, the world of Pavane is charted and claimed as part of the domain. The details from this time are again suspiciously matter of fact and brief, but reasons as to why entirely unclear. As we approach the current period of time within the Imperium, 
the Mobian Domain and Atoma Prime seem a stable and well-managed system. There has been steady growth since M35, and the system now comprises seven main worlds. The capital world of Atoma Prime, with its massive hive city of Tertium, Crucis has been designated as a shrine world, and then its five other worlds include Incron, Rosiria, Branx Magna, Pervain, and Mornax. Several vassal worlds exist as well, the most notable being Infidus Brim. Branx Magna has now expanded its industrial output and population to a level that it now even rivals Atoma Prime in terms of its gross product and industrial importance within the system. Its ruling noble household is known as Vansparzi. On Atoma Prime itself, Constant Margrave becomes the Lord Mobian, the 13th of the family line to hold the office and rule the Mobian domain. Lady Margrave, his sister, while officially subservient to her brother, also holds some power within the domain. At this time now, there is significant concern that the fringe wars which had marked the earlier period over the past 10,000 years have now started to be reported again with increasing regularity in M41. The last notable reference to these incidents was in fact some 5,000 years prior, but suddenly, without much concrete information as to why, the fringe has become once again unstable. Perhaps due to the time period being closer to the current age of the Imperium, and records being therefore more reliable and accurate, a specific world is noted within this fringe conflict for the first time. The planet of Nox Alpha, a non-domain and non-vassal world, is listed as being of particular military focus for the fringe campaign. No additional information is currently available as to the status of the Mobian domain or that of its system worlds. Until now. This is the planet. Have been reassigned to assist this is one control in the hive. Drop two, respond. Drop two, what is your data? Must it be if frontline units have been reassigned? How long until your arrival? We can Dark Tide will lead us into the true depths of the darkened future of humanity and experience it as those who survive under the choking bureaucracy of the Imperium. Tertium is what's known as a hive city, and those are the core population centers for many worlds of humanity tens of thousands of years into the future. Hive cities are complex, densely layered conurbations the size of, in some cases, countries or even continental areas. Most will accommodate populations in the billions or even tens of billions. In the case of Tertium, it's said to be 90 billion citizens, roughly speaking. Throughout the galaxy, hive cities have something of a consistent appearance, but they're also widely variable, especially in their internal structuring, management, core output for the Imperium, population, composition, military strength, and of course, they have very individual histories. Some have known near entirely peaceful times with little conflict of note, others quite literally unending states of war. Hive cities, awe-inspiring as they may be at a distance, all too often are rotten on the inside, decaying ruins built over, upon, and through the crumbling ancient ruins of previously glorious and advanced colony domes, now transitioned into vast gothic citadels, and as such, they exist not as iconic statements of humanity's technological zenith, but as unfortunately far more depressing symbols of the need to prioritize production and raw materials of mankind above all else, certainly far above the needs of the population. Now, cities exist to meet the sacrifices of flesh demanded by its leaders, that is to say, the production of humans and machines to be endlessly thrown into the meat grinder of the Imperium's unending galactic wars. Wars perpetually fueled by both internal and external conflicts. These conflicts themselves all too often stirred up by those in the Imperium itself, not to forget of course the numerous Xenos who never cease in their violent testing of the weak points along the Imperium's borders and territory, waiting for the optimal moment to strike, often when a world is weakened, or through some diabolical subterfuge, assaulting heavily defended hive cities from the inside and out simultaneously. In Dark Tide, the labyrinthine city of Tertium is described to us through the history of the Mobian domain, and thus allowing us to see a rough illustration 
of how a hive city develops upon a world. Rarely are they structures that will have been planned out or constructed by design. They're far more organic in their development. Some might even say ramshackle. Not dissimilarly though, to say how two towns may be located near one another and will eventually expand to a point where they meet and with continued development eventually become, say, a city. For humanity, many, many thousands of years into the future, this concept, like most other things, is taken to an extreme level. Hive cities are not known to be built to any kind of template construction. However, they do bear common structural relations with one another. Additionally, a common misconception is that hive cities are compared in terms generally illustrated by more typical science fiction, in the sense that every level up or down incrementally adjusts the standards of living positively or negatively. While this might be true of other verses, it is not necessarily equally applicable to hive cities. While it may be true that generally speaking industrial and fabrication processes appear to take place at the lower levels, in the case of a gargantuan city like Tertium, it will have been constructed over such a massive scale of time that at one time what may now be a mid-level would at an earlier time likely have been an upper level, perhaps even the equivalent of a hive spire. Some areas will be repurposed from the wealthy to the poor, and undoubtedly at times of construction some areas may be dismantled and repurposed. But for the scale of hive cities it's also equally possible that for whatever reason entire districts and sectors could well just be abandoned due to damage or simply forgotten about. This may all seem very superficially important, but this stratification of hive worlds is important to understand, because when it comes to something like Darktide, we will be sent into investigating a very wide range of areas, but the level you are investigating could be a mid, lower, or under hive, yet it need not automatically equate to a specific correlation with the quality or stability of the environment and infrastructure. Historical development of hive cities can be another factor in their environmental landscape. For example, as we have learned at one time, Hive Tertium was in fact multiple hive cities as you see in the current time on Necromunda with the Palatine Cluster. On Atoma Prime, their supercluster of hives merged to become the vast hive tertium. The point being, at one time those smaller hive cities had exterior areas. Some hive cities are recorded as being as small as 50 miles in diameter, whereas others will stretch for many hundreds if not thousands of miles in diameter. Specific measurements of tertium are unknown, but it's fair to say it leans significantly on the larger side. Yet, Within its dense urban sprawl, somewhere will be what remains of those outer shells of the original cluster hive cities that were expanded upon and developed to become one all-encompassing mass. The surroundings of many hive cities are devoid of any natural life whatsoever. This is because they suffer millennia of pollution and exploitation of resources. This leaves them as little more than wastelands of pollution or sometimes irradiated ash, referred to often as unsurprisingly ashen wastes. Some human tribes, individuals may still exist here though, either in micro settlements or in and around the base external areas of the hive city itself, perhaps salvaging scrap metal, staying near heat vents and using effluent to make whatever kind of food resources they can, making repairs to pipelines, transports and so on. Many worlds can contain hidden rewards in the form of available scrap, even lost technology, and those who scout these dangerous wasteland areas may even be lucky enough to venture upon a rich oxide vein or accumulation of valuable chemicals having leached from bedrock below. These pockets will be mined or collected for return and processing in a hive. What is common though is that throughout many hive cities there will be large areas, perhaps even sectors, that are locked down and declared off limits. This may be because they have become excessively contaminated from the centuries of manufacturing that they've been used for, the infrastructure may have become unstable, there may have been reports about strange occurrences that they just don't want to deal with, populations for some reason may just simply abandon an area. However, these dark and empty sectors of a hive can be very useful for those who wish not to be seen or monitored. Habs and factorums are rarely abandoned without good cause, but some areas will eventually reach a point where they're just too difficult to maintain or too dangerous. And of course, 
this is where the dangerous corrupting factions can start to take hold spreading out and bleeding into a hive city like a virus an important unknown for the Mobian Domain and Atoma Prime will be just what kind of Inquisitor has been contacted in relation to the ongoing situation within Hive Tertium. Now I have created previously a multi-part series which details the various factions of the Inquisition, because one Inquisitor of the Imperium is not like another, and for that matter, what even is an Inquisitor? Inquisitors are, very roughly speaking, galactic overseers of the Imperium, and are one of the most powerful organisations that exist within humanity's empire. Formed at the end of the Heresy by Malkador the Sigilite at the behest of the Emperor of Mankind, it remains in M41 a faction of individuals who are centred around an absolute and unbreakable commitment to the Imperium and its ideology. Of course, like so many things, it is far from being that simple. Broadly speaking though, Inquisitors are tasked with investigating any and all reports of situations which could create or actively pose a significant threat to the Imperium, or cause destabilisation to the standard order of things. Within the Inquisition, there are three core operational distinctions that generally define an Inquisitor. These are known as Ordos. The Ordo Xenos are the alien hunters experts at extermination of that which is not mankind, and when we say exterminate, it means just that, total obliteration by any means necessary. Those among the Ordo Hereticus deal with what the Imperium loosely refer to as heretics. The crimes of a heretic are not usually reserved for those exclusively to have been corrupted by what is known as chaos. It also can include the eradication of mutants, rogue psychers, and those who defy or offend the holy sanctity of the Emperor and the Imperial cult. In all honesty, the term heretic can be applied within the Imperium to just about anything that comes to mind for an Inquisitor on any given day, and it may well be used as a false pretext to eliminate problematic individuals who merely are ideologically difficult and risk unsettling the status quo. Lastly, the Ordo Malleus. These are Inquisitors who specialise in the knowledge and destruction of the nightmarish demon entities who bleed out of the parallel void space known as the Warp, the realm where only chaos exists and all humanity's worst traits are psychically dumped into it, a formless waste, the ocean of souls overflowing with unimaginable horrors. There are additional minor Ordos, see my Inquisition Part 2 in that series, as well as sub-factions of Inquisitors which we'll come to shortly. Members of the Inquisition tend to approach matters on a far broader scale than most other entities within the Imperium, and certainly far wider than those within a star system or a planet. And this has gained them a reputation as being somewhat disconnected from more ordinary humanity. For an Inquisitor, while an individual's personal sacrifice may be tragic, it stands on the wider scale as being entirely meaningless. Their core objective remains, since their inception, the lasting survival and endurance of humanity, with no authority above them other than the Emperor of Man himself. Unfortunately, for many among the Inquisition, this translates to as an ends justifying the means perspective. On more than one occasion, this has led to some fairly extreme consequences, one of the most notorious being of course the Campaign of Exterminatus, which annihilated countless heavily populated human worlds orchestrated by one Inquisitor Cryptman. He considered that in the scale of the Galactic Imperium, a string of planets being turned to ash was wholly acceptable for the greater good. This was later judged to be an unacceptable crime against humanity and the Imperium, and he was excommunicated by his fellow Inquisitors. Note only Inquisitors are able to hold other Inquisitors to justice. But it stands as a powerful example of the perspective Inquisitors are capable of seeing things from. Cripman appears to also have escaped justice and remains active in monitoring and potentially even influencing and involving himself in affairs of the Imperium and the ongoing war at Octarius. Inquisitors wield some of the most far-reaching powers given to individuals in the Imperium because of their incredibly high-ranking status coupled with unrelenting determination to purge its enemies wherever they may be found. This is but one reason why Inquisitors are greatly feared within the Imperium. 
to avoid the monolithic slow processes that are the bane of other imperial organizations and any number of annihilated worlds, the Inquisition is organized at only the most fundamental level. This is so a single Inquisitor can really demand anything of any world or servant of the Emperor, be that a pleb citizen through to even those at the highest levels of its hierarchy. In reality, high level demands do not commonly occur because as much as the Inquisition understands its power, it also understands that certain things have to be handled carefully. This of course goes both ways in that other groups like the Militarum or the Astartes will handle Inquisitors with guarded caution, yet also understand that they are an important asset and will aid them if necessary. It all depends, as per usual, on the context of any given situation and the willingness of individual parties to actually engage in good faith. Inquisitors can operate entirely independently, but far more regularly they have the assistance of a retinue. These aides are often referred to as generally acolytes, henchmen or agents, and they wield considerable power in their own right, because while not being full inquisitors, for some of their ranks are to all extents and purposes inquisitors in waiting. In terms of Darktide and Atoma Prime, the Ordo of an Inquisitor may not be a major determining factor in what transpires, be that Ordo Xenos, Hereticus, Malleus. While an Inquisitor may belong to a specialised area of Inquisition, this does not mean that they are only capable of handling incidents related to these categories, it's not that compartmentalised. Any Inquisitor may engage a request for assistance if they happen to just be the nearest available, or perhaps they have some specific knowledge of a region. The point is, most Inquisitors should be able to handle something like the outbreak of corruption as appears to be occurring upon Atoma Prime. And in terms of our information, we only know so far that an Inquisitor is likely involved in overseeing the problems facing the Mobian domain. Beyond that, we have no access to any details. What we should be concerning ourselves with though is asking what ideological branch is this Inquisitor and what could that mean for Atoma Prime and ourselves in this investigation. As the Imperium and humanity developed in the shadow of the heresy paired with the ever deepening spread of religious worship of the Emperor, the Inquisition which had begun its life as a singularly focused faction became a sprawling ideologically fractured organisation within the Imperium, and this led to the emergence of two core viewpoints in the outlook of Inquisitors, described as being either a Puritan or a Radical Inquisitor. Puritans are seen as being essentially conservative in their interpretations of their role and are adamant that the inquisitorial rule of law be followed to the absolute letter. They believe all enemies and evils afflicting humanity should be isolated and then purged with extreme prejudice. Puritans very often contain a larger share of younger inquisitors who are still to experience the breadth and complexity of the galaxy, nor have they become cynical and jaded by its horrors. Radical inquisitors are considered by some to be more realist in one sense. They see things commonly through an ends justifying the means lens, and while of course they are technically still part of the Imperium, they walk a very thin, very grey line between acceptable infractions and outright heresy. Radicals often appear after already having spent significant time as acting inquisitors and have consequently become very frustrated with an inability to achieve their goals or simply become numbed by the unrelenting darkness of the galaxy. Alternately, as is the nature of the corrupting forces of the warp, some Inquisitors may unwittingly become very gradually twisted and puppeted by entities of pure malevolence, and should they come to see things clearly, they are likely left with few choices other than to accept their fate as an outcast on the periphery of accepted Inquisitional members continually running to escape persecution or simply throw themselves onto the sometimes very literal pyre of repentance. Radicals tend to view the Puritan faction as being somewhat naive and idealistic to the true nature of the galaxy, as well as humanity's place within it. Puritans conversely see the Radicals as twisted heretics who have entirely lost their perspective. Within these core definitions, there exists also 
a further number of inquisitional sub-factions who sit under the ideological umbrella of Puritan or Radical. So we have those core ordos, then you have your Puritan or Radical, and then you have still more sub-factions ideologically underneath, such as the Amalathians, the Thorians, the Ardentites, Monodominants, Istvanism, Polysycana, Xanthites, there are many more. And we don't have enough time today to rake over all the sub-factions of the Inquisition. But the point is simply, there are many different Inquisitors, and while some may find the corruption of a vast hive city like Tertium upon Atoma Prime an interesting and essential puzzle to solve, others may decide it is already past the point of salvation and declare exterminatus, which would obviously be quite the catastrophic resolution. The key thing to understand is that Inquisitors are one of the most terrifying factions of the Imperium. Worlds live or die by their command, and their assessment of a situation like that of Tertium will have profound consequences. But critically, they can only make those assessments based on the information provided. So the discovery of what is occurring within Tertium and the severity of the situation is of course down to us. We will be exploring the vast depths of a city home to some 90 billion citizens. And strangely, in a very indirect way, we become responsible for their stability, survival, the ultimate outcome for Atoma Prime and Tertium. The vast galaxy of 40k presents us with a particularly uncommon verse to contend with. That is to say, in the sense that it is not a place you may typically desire to be a part of. The Imperium of Mankind is not an aspirational state for human civilization. It is a bleak, horrifying place that very starkly illustrates what can happen when the guardrails come off and everything goes very, very badly wrong. It prompts in us though interesting conversations about what it may mean to be human, thinking about things in a very moral, ethical, ideological, philosophical way and so on. Be that now or in the far future of such dark times upon this galactic scale. And as its introductory preamble for decades has reminded us through an indelible phrase, the age of knowledge and enlightenment has ended, the age of darkness has begun. Enlightenment has ended. The Imperium is the age of darkness and ignorance. This is of course what all 40k games should be looking to illustrate, in tone at least. The world of 40k is not welcoming. It is hot, it is uncomfortable, it is toxic. The air you breathe burns. A hive city will not be a clean, beautiful environment for the majority of citizens, and so nor will its inhabitants, save for the elite few high above the scum. The nobility in their hive spires living isolated and disconnected lives far out of reach, sight and mind from the unwashed masses below. When we find ourselves immersed within a hive world, I imagine it should prompt specific words to come to the fore in your mind. Acrid, dense, bleak, dark, stagnant, hazardous, claustrophobic, and so on. I less want to witness the world as much as I want to taste that environment, smell the oil, the rust, the sewerage. It needs to come through to you just what it means to be in this place. I'm optimistic this will be the case with Darktide. With the artwork we've seen and the access I feel very privileged to have been granted, I think it's safe to say that you can expect to see a range of distinct environments in Darktide, from more standard industrial production areas to evacuated civilian districts and those which have seen far more considerable destruction and contamination. A visually stunning cross-section of vast hive city sectors that enable us, when we consider the history of Atoma Prime and Tertium, to visually relate how a hive is constructed and to see how Imperial citizens are using that space. This is an important aspect that I really hoped to see brought to life for us in Darktide. Not dead, vacant, empty shells of cloned hab zones, but a lived in space full of variation, detritus, crumbling detail, everything from top to bottom occupying a purposeful space. Vents and doorways placed with a thought through reasoning for being there, as well as an impressive, awe-inspiring sense of scale. Adjacent access areas, small side rooms and tunnels to be discovered, not just arbitrarily slapped for visual effect. I want it to be a living world. And what I mean by that is obviously 
it seems unlikely to expect that we're going to be pushing through crowds of hundreds of thousands of citizens. We as a team are entering into a hostile, presumably quarantined, locked down sector areas. Any and all who lived in a space are either going to be evacuated, dead or contaminated. But the point is, it doesn't have to feel empty nor dead. We see through all the amazing environmental concept art that the game features a plethora of changing zones from your more typical hive city, some even appear to show us environmental conditions breaching into specific zones. We will find ourselves in the filth and decay of a city where repairs are made by just what happens to be at hand, which feels very human. Crushed concrete, ferrocrete, wooden battens, metal gangways, chain link fences, all kinds of infrastructure falling apart, smashed together, some things tied to a doorway, metal sheets pinned in place to make a temporary repair, vain attempts to shield those below from the continually falling industrial runoff and pollution from the zones and sectors above that cause visible changes to an environment. Atoma Prime is a world trying to contain the spread of dangerous contamination, which risks the stability and viability of an entire hive city containing some 90 billion citizens. Quite obviously a massive and significant issue. Only made worse of course by the high pressure to fulfil its critical industrial output quotas for the Imperium. The importance in keeping Tertium operational means we'd fully expect to see Imperial forces deployed already within the hive itself, locking down areas, holding positions in and out of specific zone entry points. As the Inquisitor's condemned scout team, we imagine ourselves to be dropping in through access points, only gaining entry to new areas through heavily guarded positions or immense sector access gates. The narrative of Darktide is something that will be revealed in greater detail to us through all of these multi-layered details as we explore the Hive City. But for me personally, what I wanted to emphasize today through this video and what I hope you will take away is a story is never just about what you are being literally described to through written mission reports on a data slate. Because that's very plain, clinical, it doesn't generate feelings, emotions and immersion. It's not information unlocked back at a central deployment hub point. Narrative and story is about more than words. It's about the experience, the feeling you get, and the cooperative moments you experience together. It's the entire process of exploration, combat engagement, and discovery. It's about the shadows moving in the dark, the light cascading down from bizarre imperial machinery hundreds of meters above you as you walk into a huge industrial processing room or a Valkyrie loading zone. It's whirling around as enemies jump at you from all directions. It's about the sound of the weapon as it engages with your enemy and the face full of showering blood as you bisect a heretic back to back with your squad mates. It's shooting a twisted chaos hound as it leaps upon you from above and is shot clean out of the air just as your squad mate steps out of the way. It's seeing corrupted infantry take up positions and lay down covering fire, forcing you to outflank them. You think you have an upper hand, but then a shower of chemical Prometheum pours down on you from above and the suffocating weight of the horde threatens to end your time among the living. It's all of this and more. This is what the experience of Darktide will offer. Most critically, of course, a key element of Darktide is for your developing story to be told to us through the characters themselves whilst we are engaged with missions. Their banter and clips of audio heard from environmental sound, distant loudspeakers, and we've learned so far that they've created 75,000 lines of dialogue. All of this variable depending on your mission success and things that are occurring organically integrated through our experience. We've also learned Darktide will develop as a live service, so this will not be a one and done thing at release. Although it has been promised that content at the point of release will be substantial and not merely an introduction, which allows us an even more appealing prospect of a story that evolves with you as you're exploring Tertium. Now it's understandable to feel the fear anybody naturally may when they hear the word live service. It's fear born out of other games essentially paywalling experiences. With Darktide, this has been clarified very firmly from the outset as not being the case. The developers have stated that any and all game updates which contribute missions and therefore the story will be free updates for the entire player base. This means no fragmentation of squad and friends, it's a steadily unravelling narrative. Definitive clarifications like this are really welcomed, and quite honestly, something to be lauded in this day and age. Thankfully as well, core missions will work and play out of sequence, meaning you won't be forced to grind away at the same specific zones, and the overall narrative built through a developing campaign, plus of course, your personal character development. But most interestingly, that banter and chat you have between characters will develop as well 
as missions are added and the situation on Tertium adjusts, which is really very interesting. Initially, we're brought in, obviously, as a necessary expansion of investigations. Our core objectives are, from the outset, to further establish what specific threat the Hive City is facing. Once our team have settled into a flow of tactical cooperation, they'll be able to steadily refine their combat efficiency and enable further progress to discovering more as to just what is happening within Tertium. But at that point, who knows what other factors might complicate matters and contribute to the developing story. We know that weapons will be locked in for specific classes, which makes reasonable sense from a law point of view. The weapons are also placed appropriately for the human scum team that will be deployed. Iconic lasgun, autogun, ogryn shotgun, plasma gun, chainsword with its revving for extra ripping and tearing, the thunder hammer, and there's an auto pistol, which looks to be very satisfying, not to mention grenades, stabby knives, and so on. Now this lean on class restrictions is no bad thing for me personally speaking. It's even something that I've advocated for in the past with games. And as I genuinely believe, it helps to focus people as part of a squad into what they're supposed to be doing. It can still be contentious because some people just prefer the full freedom to choose any and all things. Personally, I think that can be damaging for a game experience and balance. But either way, the decision is made in Darktide for specializing and limited classes, so you can make of it what you will. But the next obvious question would be, so how much can you customize your squad? And the answer is plenty. You're not limited to maintain a balanced class composition. So if you wanted to roll with four rifle wielding guardsmen, have at it. What about two guardsmen, two Ogryn? Sure, four Ogryn, let's go. Hammer smashing zealots to destroy the heretics, you got it. A team of psychers to twist your enemies with the power of the warp, good luck. Squad composition provides a significant amount of gameplay variability and it shifts the role you as a player have. Each class has specific strengths and weaknesses and this is only further emphasized by the necessary inclusion of that very 40k balance between ranged and melee. So if you do take your four guardsmen, you will certainly have that ranged firepower, but you could also find yourself lacking at specific points in a zone where numbers threaten to overwhelm or some big thing comes lumbering out of the darkness and slaps you sideways. If your team is skilled enough though, you may still prevail, but it all depends on how you approach fast changing situations and obviously how cleanly and at all times selflessly your squad works together. As those of you know from my gaming history, this is something I significantly enjoy and it's a core feature of a co-op experience. Your squad composition will at least partially dictate whether you're readily able to rinse through a horde of enemy, but in other moments you'll need to communicate quickly and clearly to survive. So as is often the case, being the squad mate continually shouting out, they're on the left, whilst you're in an expansive, multi-level engineering structure is probably not going to cut it. So weapon discipline, communication and confidence in quickly adapting the squad dynamics is key to your success. Example, falling back upon each other as a horde of enemies washes in or intuitively splitting into teams of two to best handle specific threats and objectives will all be key to ensure your survival and mission success. As a final reminder, you can pre-order the game right now on Steam, so do check the link directly below, so you can check out all the details about what aesthetic extras are included at the launch of the game later this year, September 13th. I'm sure we'll have additional opportunities to see in even more detail what we can expect as Imperial prisoners thrown down into exploring firsthand the nightmares facing humanity in M41, as individuals clinging on to our last lifeline and to serve the Emperor in the vain hope of redeeming ourselves. We step into a world of bleak darkness, suffocating bureaucracy and industrial warfare, to peel back the adamantium skin of a hive city and experience a measure of what it means to exist as a member of humanity amid a galactic civilization decaying in real time, stagnated by citizens whose general ignorance is eclipsed by unquestioning loyalty, who will always obey without question those who dictate the fundamental parameters of their lives and ours upon Atoma Prime. We are the anonymous flesh motes amidst the ocean of trillions of human souls spread throughout the wider galaxy, only ever knowing as much as they are told, only ever knowing as much as they need to. And all they need to know is, of course, to serve the Imperium to give it its wider purpose, unconditionally. For in the dark, far future of M41, human lives pale in comparison to the power and glory of the Imperium of Mankind and its carrion corpse emperor. As do we, 
condemned prisoners whose lives are already judged to be over. But now, billions of human lives depend on our success. What awaits us? Undoubtedly, the horrors and monstrosities beyond human imagination. But the Imperium is an empire fueled by human suffering. To save Atoma Prime and Tertium, there is no choice to make. We are required to enter the darkness and face the horror. Are not all orders sent down to us the direct will of the Emperor of Man? Then it must be done. There is no option. Only we can face the dark tide. My Lord Inquisitor, I have reached a term of prime and begun our investigations. Our recon squad has been sent into sub-level 6 of the Hive. I'll know more when they make it back. 